why am I getting this like burning sensation right in the middle of my chest? Rafael. <laughs> How are you? How are you? It's good to see you. It's good to see you. Family's good? Good. Yeah, and um, one day it just got bad, you know, so I called my wife and said, why don't you set up a meeting with the doctor? And I go in there and uh, say, well, there isn't much I can do. We got to send it to a specialist. So um, initially they said, maybe we can just stent it, you know. And then they said, oh, no, this is not possible. Yining, good morning. How are you? It's good to see you. <laughs> and... Um, they said, well, that's not going to work. You know, three of them are clogged, all three of them. So it was an eight-hour procedure. For those of you who may have an open-heart surgery later in the future, I hope you don't, but if you do, you know, they kind of just um, cut your chest. They yank it open. <laughs> you know, they grab uh, a few, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it was beautiful. Um, but you know the nice thing, I, I don't know if it's a nice thing, but you know, I'm, I think it's second or third or fourth day of recovery, I'm walking around, that's what you ought to do. And you're walking around um, the space that has only maybe 12, 13 beds to occupants in each, you know, uh, bedroom, so to speak. And there are people in their 80s and 90s who just had like, open heart, you know, surgery. And I'm looking at them and saying, my God, you know, I'm a young man and this is painful. How the hell are they surviving this? And uh, it was such a humbling experience. But... How old you? I just had it done a couple months ago. Oh my gosh, that's, that's what, what you were doing? Yeah. You, you thought what I was in Hawaii, like I swimming? I didn't know what you were doing and I didn't assume yeah because that's silly so, yeah you know under the circumstances i had difficulty coming back i you know it's it's something i talked about yesterday in the philosophy class that you know i've done enough talking in my life i've been in the classroom for almost 30 years and uh i've been around students for almost 30 years and so being away and being on the bed for as long as I was for the past maybe, I don't know, two months or so, you realize you're actually quite okay with uh, not expressing what lives inside you. And I think it takes some time to get to that place. I think when you're young, your task is to really not be so solitary. Go out there and tell people how you're doing about anything. You broke up with your boyfriend, or you just had a fight with your companion, or you hate your classes and you hate your instructors. I mean, you need to be social, you know, where people become a conduit, where you can kind of just express, just, you know, like a volcano, just erupt. And hopefully make sure that you erupt amongst people who like you, you know. Um, there comes a point where you have kind of heard your own voice and your own complaints enough times where you say... No, I know I'm in pain. I know that um, it's nice to kind of tell the other person I'm in pain, but it's not going to do much good. I'm just going to keep it to myself. And um, I think you get to kind of let time pass, 20, 30, 40, 50 years until you get there, you know, which is a really, I think, good space to be in. But all that aside, yeah, Rafael. You think that could have happened if we didn't kill God? What do you mean? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> With the AI. Here we go again. <laughs> Raphael, I must say, I didn't miss you at all. <laughs> I'm persistent. <laughs> no, it's, it's the peak of science. What do you mean? What you just experienced. It's the peak of science. It's the tip of the, tip of the spear of science. Science? Take the easy way out. I mean, there are a couple of things. I think nothing can stand the force of rationality and reason. If I ask you why you're married, I mean, sure, you can give me some nice little stories, but if I was to examine 
the narratives you're sharing with me, I think your entire story of why you got married, and why you had children, and why you are the way you are, and why you do the things that you do, they would all fall apart. So when you listen to you know, some of the new age gurus like Sam Harris and other rationalists who come on the stage and say, oh, God is dead, why do people need religion? And the truth is, if you have a high powered intellect, if you have a very sharp reasoning abilities, the truth is, most of the things, if not all the things we do in life, are ridiculous and absurd. It makes no sense. Why do people believe in anything? You know, the truth is you believe in things because you need stories to live by. They provide some sort of a map, a GPS to life. You know, the re only reason why your marriage is surviving is because of the narratives you've created. And all the guilts and all the shames and all the responsibilities and all the cultural heritage that you're carrying on your shoulders. It keeps your marriage alive. Now imagine if you were to put all those things under the razor sharp, you know, reason. They wouldn't last. You'd go home, look at your wife and say, why am I here with her? Am I doing it because I'm lonely? If I'm lonely, am I exploiting her, manipulating her, using her for all the wrong reasons? Why do I have children? I'm not really a good father. Why do I have children in this particular culture? knowing full well that my kids will eventually turn out to be like me, confused, angry, lonely, you know, addicted to technology of all sorts. And all of a sudden you realize, well, you're just a crummy human being. You should just find a cliff and jump from it, you know. Uh, so you can kill God, but you have no choice but to create another God, whether it's your wife or husband, whether it's a school, whether it's your job, it makes no real difference. You need something to believe in. Because I'm using the death of God as a metaphor. It's not about reading oh. God, but when you keep on saying we don't have any more GPS, this is this culture as as right all the, also has created. I was devil's advocate. I'm glad we, we we I'm glad you you had a, I'm glad you're here today with healthy and happy. Where I'm going <laughs> is how do you accept like, whatever it is there's nobody but the, the the complete madness of this American culture, I guess, of the culture we is also produces open heart surgery. What do you? How do you balance those two? I, I, how do you? I don't know. Accept, feel, feel, I don't know. Manage those two in your head. How do you um, accept? I guess. Well, there are a couple of things. I think um, one would hope that as you get older in life, that you have gained enough maturity to kind of review your life and accept your life and who you've become, you know, that most of the chapters that you have started to write, they're near completion. You know, it's not like I'm a 20 year old kid going to school, hoping to become a teacher and all of a sudden I have to do open heart surgery. And this particular dream of mine, being in the classroom, having some degrees, it has been incomplete. And so the open heart surgery now, for example, becomes an obstacle to allowing me to bring this particular fantasy or dream to life. I don't have that. So in that regards, I've been in the classroom for 30 years. I'm done. It's good. It's finished. You know, I'll be here for another maybe 5, 10, 15, 20 years if I'm lucky. Uh, but should it end earlier, it's okay, you know. So I think as long as you have kind of... Um, look at some of the traumas, if you have any inside you, and you say, okay, I've come to accept, that's okay. Then you can accept the finality of your life much easier, much better, much healthier. If on the other hand, you're still sifting at the age of like 50 or 60 or 70 as to why this and why that, poor me, then it's going to be a really, really difficult place to be. You know? Um, I guess I found a way to express it. But how do you re reconciliate in yourself the accepting the need for religion or for GPS, that, that those religions, those stories, embracing those stories and still live here and enjoy the, what's good about this? Hence, open heart surgery or other things that are good from living in this, this motherhood. How do you combine, how do you accept both? Maybe if you have one or two kids. Two. I guess I'm putting them in conflict for some reason. Well, look, 
Being a parent is no easy task. It begins with a fantasy. You know, I want to have a family. I want to do this. I want to do that. It's like every, anything else under the sun. It begins with this unvarnished story. I'm going to go to school and I'm going to get my degrees and the assumption is all oh, your classes are going to be fun, your instructors are going to be inspiring, that you're going to read good books, you're going to become intellectually mature. That's, that's how things begin. Now, as a father, you should know that you go home and the house is a mess. The kids are this two bundles of energies that all they want to do is just break everything that's in the house, you know. And you realize the moment you go home to the time you go to bed, you're just cleaning up after them, screaming at them, telling them to do this and that. And then the question is, well, is it really worth it? How do you uh, kind of survive the conflict? Being a father, screaming, being nice to them, being, you know, very forgiving of them. And the truth is, well, that's how you cope. That's what you do. Now, while you're in bed and everybody's asleep, and just sitting back and reviewing how your day was spent, sure, you can be angry. That's where the conflict begins. While you're engaged, engagement without reflection is okay. Engagement with reflection, let me tell you what happens to... Yeah, sometimes, it even happens to me at this stage in my life, when I'm in the classroom, I become very self-conscious. Like, am I dressed okay? Am I talking okay? Am I mumbling? Am I making sense? For some strange reason, I don't know how to respond to this particular question. <clears throat> and I become very nervous. And then I keep looking at the clock because I want the class to end. And it happens because I'm reflecting. I'm questioning and doubting. But right now, no, I don't really care. You know, I'm back after two months, we're just chit-chatting. It can go well, it can go unwell, <laughs> you know. So whenever you reflect on anything, uh, there is a space between you and your life. And it's not going to be fun. Anyways, that doesn't answer your question, but it doesn't matter. So... Um, Are we done? Kendra did well. Kendra? Yeah. Oh yeah, she's great. Chris is a lot of fun. Good morning. I'm sorry? Chris is a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Chris is fun and he has a nice beard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jamie, how are you? Horrible. Horrible, you said? Learning a lot. But you know. It's not, it's not good enough. Like Adlini? Or just in general? All of you are welcome back. Very kind, thank you. <laughs> so what you're saying is, life sucks, but welcome back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is that where we were just talking? <laughs> where we said say the same thing? <laughs> yeah. Well, if there are other things you guys want to talk about, you know, if you have an hour. Yeah, yeah, Grace. So, uh, I was a teacher, but it was at the end of class, and then we didn't come back to it. I forgot. Did you have any questions about it? So, um, a lot of this class seems to talk about knowing yourself and understanding yourself. But so much of I'm curious about the difference between your internal understanding of self and the understanding of self that other people give to you. What the difference is and if you can ever like separate between Because yeah, you know. yeah. <sighs> Can you repeat the question? Yeah, absolutely. I, it's probably going to be a slightly different version. It's all right. I don't remember what I said. Every time I, <laughs> I don't remember what you said either. But. Nice. We did it together. <laughs> Every Jeez. time I talk in front of people, I was like, Oh, my God. Uh, okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. Um, I'm curious about the difference between 
there's a difference between the characteristics of self that you understand about who you are that are told to you by other people than the ones that you just like the, the words you find to yourself, the labels and the things that you think you know about yourself. And I'm wondering if there actually is. Mm. May I? Yeah, please. Yeah. Can I first give you a poem? Absolutely. In Persian. Cool. Without translating it. Sounds fine to me. Right. Let me let me see if I can remember the whole thing. Pedari ba pesari gof be qahr ke tu adam nashavi jan pedar. ایف از آن اوم که ای بی سر و پا در پی تربیتت کردم سر دل فرزند از این حرف شکست بی خبر از پدرش کرد سفر بسیار رنج کشید و پس از آن زندگی گشت به کامش چو شکر آقابت شوکت و والایی یافت حاکم شرح شد و صاحب زر چند روزی بگذشت و پس از آن ام فرمود به هزار پدر پدرش آمد از راه دراز نزد حاکم شد و بشناخت پسر پسر از آیت خودبینی و قایت از خودبینی و جهل نظر افکند به سر و پای پدر گفت گفتی که تو آدم نشوی نظر افکند به این جا و جبر پی خندید و سرش داد تکان گفت این نکته برون شد از در من نگفتم که تو حاکم نشوی گفتم آدم نشوی it's a very long poem by Abdul Rahman Jami, who was a Sufi poet. I'm not quite sure what century. But it's an answer to your question in a very indirect way that one day a father looks at the son and says, when are you going to amount to something decent? Become a human being. Ethical, mature, reflective, now that is a perspective imposed by the father onto the son. And the father says, you know, I wasted all of my life raising you, and this is the outcome. Now what you have is the father reflecting on his life and his time wasted by what he hoped his son to become, but he never did. Children also desire to please their parents, you know, maybe to some extent fulfill their dreams and hopes. And the remark of the marks of his father kind of bothers him. So without telling his father, he departs. He goes on a long journey, suffers quite a bit, and eventually he becomes a king of a certain providence in Iran. And um, he becomes like Donald Trump, lots of money. Usually when you become rich like that, whether you're rich intellectually, whether you're rich physically, arrogance overcomes you, you know. And so he says, well, I remember my father telling me that I won't amount to anything. Let me call him into my kingdom. Let him see what I have become. So he demands for his father's presence. The father comes from a long journey. And the son looks at him. And then says, well, I've amounted to something profound. My father, on the other hand, look at him. So he looks at his father and says, remember you telling me I won't amount to nothing? Look at what I've accomplished. But the old man laughs and says to him, I never said that you will not make money. I never said you will not become a king or a mayor or this or that. I just said you will never become a human being. 
there's a difference between being rich and being a human being. There's a difference between getting a degree in philosophy and being a philosopher. You see. Sometimes if you're around the right people, their perspective of you can be very helpful. If you write an essay for me, and let's just say you respect me to some extent, and that respect creates some, let's say, intense emotions such as love, care, and that also creates its own branch of fear, which is healthy, that you fear my judgment should it be negative. And so you'll try your best to write the good essay. And so you write the essay and I return it to you and it's filled with red marks. Well, that's a judgment, me upon you, and it's going to make you feel bad. And you're going to go home and instead of spending two hours writing an essay, you're going to spend six hours. That's a good judgment, you know, to be caring by you. If on the other hand, I was like Snoop Dogg, you know, Eminem. You didn't much care for me, my talents, my judgments wouldn't you know, offend you at all. So to some extent, you need to care for someone and you need to respect someone and you need to fear someone to have their judgments affect you. Okay. Now, if you, have, if you don't know me and if you don't care for me, you don't really care what I say about you. I mean, you may consider that to be somewhat offensive, but the truth is it's not going to like go inside your soul and you're going to go home with it. You may form a complaint here and there, but it'll be forgotten. If on the other hand, your father had said something to you repeatedly over the years, that's going to kind of be chronic depression after a while. And you'll probably need about 30 years of therapy to overcome it. Okay. So for the most part, it depends who's making the judgment. Okay. Now, that's one side of it. The other is you are a social animal, which means that you're born in the 21st century. And because you live in the 21st century American, American culture, you have no choice but to be to some extent conditioned program. Your software is the f set of advertisements given to you by the 21st century Oakland. There is no escape from it. Okay. And so when you tell me I love this kind of music, well, you love this kind of music because of the way this culture is. And for some strange reason, this particular genre of music taps into certain parts of you and they mesh well. Right. And given that you are a social animal, you are the product of your environment. Depending on the sort of stories that kind of live inside the culture. Okay. If, for example, you have a religion, and that religion is very, very important to the culture, it'll say to you, it's good to have lots of money in your pocket, but don't forget that you also have a soul. If that is part of the cultural narrative, it doesn't matter how rich you become. You're always going to have moments where this other story comes in and says, Grace, you have a PhD, but you're not a doctor. It doesn't mean anything. Okay? And that's a good conflict to have. Um, you could say that if in your culture there is this element of religion that says to you, you're not just meat, you're also spirit, that's another, say, software that you have no choice but to adopt. <sighs> Since everything is nothing but a story that has been sold to us, is there a spiritual self? Well, I think if you believe in it, then there's a good chance that you're going to gravitate towards certain genres of music, literature, people you want to associate with. If on the other hand, that particular narrative doesn't exist in you and your people, I, no. But I must say that Religious traditions around the world have created some very, very beautiful works of art, temples, statues, literature, poetry. They're great. Um, and when you look at them, they do you know, inspire certain emotions that a secular culture basically can't.
Hello, how are you? Good. Michael. How do you remember? You're still wearing black. Huh? <laughs> You're still wearing black. Yeah. This is Jamie. She likes black too. The problem is the book. The problem is the book? Those, those religions that built beautiful things that give birth to emotions in us, like that generate emotions in us that really yeah. and peak emotion, peak experiences, hopefully, right? So something like this. So sometimes the book comes to book. It depends on the peak emotion. If you happen to talk about, say, the American culture and the way it views sex and the way it views relationships, well, when you're like 15 or 16, you experience your first love. It's a very peak emotion to be had at such a young age. And it's going to contaminate, poison your soul, because at the age of 15, you really don't have the tools to sustain such emotions or such relationships. So it's going to leave this dark mark inside you. You're always going to compare your future relationships to this first experience. And it's not going to last, you know, unless you get to a certain place in life where you say, yes, I fell in love and I went to a therapist office for five years to overcome this particular love. I'm now 35. I want to have a child or children. I want to find a nice man or a nice woman to get married to and all that stuff. So your intention is now different. You're not so much wanting to fall in love, have those peak experiences. You're a bit more rational. You become a bit more political. You choose a man, hopefully, who has a job, who, uh, who is intellectually and emotionally stable, you know, who's not like your father or like your mother, all that stuff. Um, if you're not at that stage, in other words, even if your body cries out to have a child, but you realize you're just not ready because you're still stuck on the experience of 15, the truth is that peak experience will ruin you. Now, there are some other peak experiences where you read a book, or let's say you watch Godfather, and you like those kind of movies, and uh, you watch all five or six or seven parts of it, or maybe the Harry Potter series, and then you say, I, I want to watch another set of movies that uh, contain the same magical elements. You know, and you keep looking and looking and looking, but no movies are to be found. And then after a while, you realize, well, it's, it's hopeless, really, your quest. You're not going to find good movies that match all the emotions that you experience while watching Harry Potter. One of the books that I personally like, or like, because um, was, um, I've mentioned this before, uh, The Daughter of Fire. It's about 900 pages. So what happened after I had finished the book, I said, okay, is there another book just like it? I looked at Last Barrier, I looked at The Invisible Way, I looked at The Awakened Dreams, maybe five or six or seven books. I haven't read a good book. I haven't even been inspired to read a good book, cover to cover, in maybe 20 years. I read a sentence, maybe a paragraph, maybe just the title of the cover. But that's it, that's as far as I go, because no book can ever come close. And to some extent, it's because what I myself experienced while reading Daughter of Fire, I enjoy the emotions. I enjoyed running from the car wash to my room, you know, opening the chapter and continue to read for the next like four, five, six hours, and then read the book over again. And it wasn't so much about the book, it was mostly about could I see myself on the pages? And the answer was yes. Now, for the past 20, 30 years, I've been looking for a book that I can read and you know, have glimpses of myself. And the only thing that comes up is disgust. You know, I don't like the way this book is written. I don't like the unfinished way that this guy is expressing the ideas. And so, um, Abi, good morning. How are you? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. So yeah, I hope you never have peak experiences, that life can be, you know, 
unusually uninteresting. Yeah, and, and you know, I got to say, you and I are very lucky people because most of our friends and the people we hang out with are just mediocre. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, when you hang out with mediocre people, you're not inspired to become better. I mean, imagine if you want to play chess with Magnus Carlsen. Or you want to hang out with Einstein. They wouldn't tolerate you, or me, or any one of us in this classroom. But we have friends because they're kind of useless. <sighs> this is not a good, yeah. When we were talking about things, you know, things never measuring up to the first place, how everything will fall short or end. Uh, and are, so are you getting at that we're looking for something eternal? We're looking for an experience or a partnership that lasts forever? Yeah, that would be the I don't know what we're looking for. Fair enough. I just hope that when this class is over and as I'm walking to my office, I can kind of, if lucky, think back and say, that was a really, really good conversation. And most often that doesn't happen. I walk away from all my classes and they say, that was awful, disgusting, disturbing. Nice. Which is good because after a while you don't expect very much from yourself or other people. Conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. And mediocrity continues. It's great. Well, I aspire to make it worse. <laughs> Thank you, Grace. But before we go to Rafael, is there anyone else who hasn't yet said much, but wants to, but can't because they're shy and reserved? Or Rafael, please. You said earlier that it's possible sometimes to act and reflect. Mm -hmm. Why do I feel like action and reflection is the opposite? That reflection will... I don't know. I don't know if it's an early stage of reflection, but I feel like it's always telling me, don't act. Every, every, everything you do will corrupt. That's, I guess that's an early stage of reflection, but I feel like they're opposite. Well, they are. They are opposite. Whenever you want to be engaged in anything that's on the outside, you have to find some value in it. The imposition has to be intense enough where you kind of get consumed. You know, and then you just do, you react. Uh, there are certain, I think, moments or maybe even a stage of life you enter where you want to raise your hand and you want to ask a question or you want to make a comment. And it's right there. It's about to come out. And all of a sudden, something about you opens up and says, how old are you? 60. How often have you talked in your life? Very often. How many questions have you asked? You know, maybe a million questions. How many answers did you get? Well, maybe a million and a half. And it has gotten you where? Nothing. So why don't you just keep your mouth shut? And even though, you know, it's at the very tip of your tongue about to come up, come out, you kind of stop yourself because of the act of reflection. And reflection is a tendency of going to the past, examining some of the components, traveling into the future, asking yourself, what is the outcome of this particular engagement? And then what reflection eventually will do is say, it's not worth it. And what will happen, one of the benefits of this, in the long run, it'll make you profoundly self-sufficient. You have no need to talk, you have no need to express, you have no need to communicate because you can basically just be preoccupied with yourself and by yourself and about yourself. You know, it's like, when Costco is next door, why the hell would you want to go to 7-Eleven? You know, you want to buy a gallon of milk 7-Eleven for 11 bucks, just go to Costco, pay nine bucks and get three gallons. Uh, but it takes some time to get there. You know, it's kind of like, uh, 
you know, you walk around campus and you run into your colleague and he says to you, this is my last year, I'm going to retire. Retire? What are you going to do? I don't care. I just don't want to be here anymore. Like, you don't want to talk? You don't want to see people? No, I'm done talking and seeing people. It's a great place to be. Whether or not they're successful, you know, staying away and keeping to themselves is a different story. You know, you have to kind of be tested a little bit. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it becomes difficult because if you go back to Grace's first question about other people's judgments and, you know, their impact on you. If you know yourself well enough, and I don't mean the spiritual self, just how you've been made, how you usually react, and how you usually feel about things, uh, you become very passive to other people's judgments and the perception of you. Now, it doesn't mean that it's always going to be that way, but I think 80, 90% of the time, you just don't care what other people say. Which is it? Jamie? Michael? Would you say it's better to just be by yourself instead of trying to deal with all these things? No. I think when you're young, you need to go out there. And, uh, you know, it's like you coming to my office and saying, I want to drop out of school and travel the world. There are lots of benefits in going out there and just seeing how other people live, you know, what their ideas about life is. That's great. But when you're young, I think it's good to have a savings account, despite all the awful things about education. Literally, if you do things the right way, you can be done with school by the time you're 25, even 30, let's just say. Okay. Now you have the savings account, which is you have a bachelor's or a master's or let's just say even a PhD. You don't have very much money, but you have a couple of degrees. Go away, travel. When you grow tired of traveling and seeing the world, now you can come back and use your savings account in a way that kind of makes your life a bit richer, more meaningful, 